Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty that I'm one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 134. Today's guest is a veteran actor of stage and screen. You know him from Animal House, where the Buffalo Roam, Oscar, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Ally McBeal and Mad Men. And of course, he played Bob Cobb, the maestro in two oh. Seinfeld episodes, <laughs> the maestro and the doll. Please welcome Mark Metcalf. Mark, thanks for joining I can't believe you used that name. <laughs> I still cringe when I hear that name. <clears throat> yes, thanks. Welcome. Welcome to you all, too. Odd good selection of credits to read out. Well, Where the Buffalo Roam. Have you actually seen Where the Buffalo Roam? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, I have to say, I saw it. I wanted it to be better, but I still liked it, obviously. It's still a classic. I still love it. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm a big Bill Murray fan, a Bill Hunter, Thompson, Hunter S. Thompson fan, so I definitely have seen it several times. But yeah. it's one of those, every time I watch it, I'm, I'm, I'm more and more confused as to, like, what is, like, it, it just never seemed to connect. It never came together. Right? Yeah, but it's, yeah. you know, still, you know. it's. A, I don't know why. I haven't seen it since it, actually right after it was made, so I don't know why. Art Linson's a better producer than he is a director. Um, I don't know. And a uh, hunter was, was hovering around while we were making it, but he wasn't allowed on the set or allowed to be nearby. He once I'm told, I didn't see it. He uh, came to the set with two pearl handled, uh, 45 revolvers and forced his way onto the set. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, well, uh, let's, let's shift back to Seinfeld, Mark. So, yeah, sure. So, Take us back. I can't believe it's been 27 years ago. The Maestro, named obviously for you, incredible honor. It's very rare that an episode gets named after a guest star, but you certainly stole that show. So 27 years ago, The Maestro, where it's 17 years after, um, obviously, Niedermeyer and, and, Niedermeyer and Animal that House, incredible right. film. But tell us a little bit about how the role of Bob Cobb, as you mentioned, oh. um, came about was there an audition process tell us a little bit about uh i will if you pro i'll happened. tell you if you'll promise not to use that name again um <laughs> yes uh yes of course there was i don't know how many people but probably everybody who seemed to be right maybe 500 people auditioned for it the first time and i didn't i saw three or four of them when we waited in the lobby uh to go in and then that was i think probably on a Oh, Wednesday, maybe. And we all knew that it was going to start shooting the following Monday. And I didn't hear anything the rest of Wednesday. And I didn't hear anything Thursday until late in the day. And then I got a call from my agent said they want to see you again tomorrow, Friday. So I went in Friday and read again. And now they've whittled it down to who knows, maybe 15 or 20 people. And uh, I auditioned for them then and had a good time. They laughed. Jerry was there. Uh, Larry was there. I think Jerry and Larry were both there for the first audition, too. And I went home and thought, well, I'll hear something later tonight because they start shooting on Monday. And I didn't. But on Saturday, I got a call from my agent and said, they want to see you again on Sunday. Could you go back? And I lived at this time in Port Wainimi, California, which is about, <coughs> excuse me, about 50 miles north up the coast from L from LA where they shoot where they shot it and where they did aud all the auditions and everything so I drove back down and auditioned again on Sunday and thought well I'll either get it or I won't get it what can I do and I came home in late Sunday night I got a call they said yes they want you to do it be there tomorrow at 10 o'clock so yeah I auditioned like everybody else and uh they whittled it down and eventually decided that I was the one they wanted. Very cool. Your 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 first your first uh, scene, the first episode, the Maestro, when you you knock on Kramer's door with a little bit of a beat. Is yes. that is that your choice? I, I just always love that. You're the Maestro. You your first time on screen. You give yourself a little bit of a, a little beat on the door. As uh, Martin just Scorsese says, 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 "Movies are my life." Well, for the Maestro, music is his life. Everything. Is music, yes, yeah. So I, great yeah, I, I knocked. That was my knock. Oh, always, always love that. And and then Good. you've already done it twice with us. You do it twice in the episode. The uh, the great 
hand head grab on the uh here yes. here in the name uh yeah <laughs> another great now when she does it she does she mentions it she calls me bob at dinner and then uh, i can't remember another time but yeah it's always a, it's like my scrotum tightens up and goes right up and pulls my skull down onto it <laughs> yeah you you mentioned her you're you're referencing obviously uh julia louis dreyfus yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah it's a really yeah. great scenes i mean Kind of that that makeout session you had with her was, I mean, as passionate as Seinfeld ever got in our in our mind, right? I mean, oh Bob, and and yeah, you did the thing again, and oh Maestro, and then you just really passionate stuff there with Julia, great chemistry. She a good she a good kisser, <laughs> and, and, and good actors find the chemistry. Yeah, she's a she's a great, obviously a great yeah. comedian. Uh, a wonderful actress, uh, as we've seen now as in the 27 years since what she's done with Veep and everything else. And uh, if you, they talk about chemistry in movies all the time and either the chemistry works. The chemistry happens if the two actors decide that they will work together and they'll find each other. And, and, uh, and we did. She, and she's a, just a, a real, she's a mensch. She's a good human being. Yeah, it really looked like you guys were having a legitimately good time in the car when you're we both doing the conducting to the music. Were you oh, hearing good. that music or were you doing that sort of just at, like, did they play music in the background? Because you, you guys were like right on cue and you're both in the car and she's doing the whole thing. I think it was a Verity song or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we were all doing, we were doing it. We just both knew it and we did it. I don't think there was a track behind us supporting it or anything. Right. I think we just did it. Yeah. You guys uh, were having so much fun doing that. She was really yeah. into it. You were really into it. In, in yeah. The cars. It, was, well, it, uh, it was fun. It's a, yeah. Good writing. Good so writing. Incredible writing. Uh, and Larry David wrote your first episode and Gamble and Prost wrote the others. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Back to, I'm just always curious, back to the audition, you mentioned you saw some 50 people tried out. Any any names we would recall? Because we can't picture anyone else being the maestro other than you, but... Thank you. It's always interesting to see, like, who was also going for that. Do you recall? I, I don't know. And as I said, they they kept us separate, so we didn't see everybody, and I didn't ask, because for me, and I think it's probably true for most actors, I would rather just be working against myself rather than against the, I'd rather not have to audition next to uh, 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 who, uh, I don't know who the actors are, the Robert De Niro, okay, from somebody from my generation. I'd rather not be, know that I'm competing against him. I'm only competing against myself. I know it's a competition. There's a hundred people auditioning. One of us will do it. So there's some level of competition, but it, it's better for me if I keep that just about myself. So I, if I ever knew who else, I have forgotten. I've repressed that memory. I, I don't. I don't know. So Sorry. interesting. Interesting. You mentioned Nero. I, I, I've I've heard you talk about this over the years as the idea of a typecast. Right? You grew mm -hmm. up in the Hoffman De Niro kind of era. Those yeah. guys. Those guys kind of had their thing. Yeah. You, right. You had that authoritative voice, kind of neutral looking. Uh, I'm curious if that if that played a part in the maestro as well. I, you didn't yell, per se, but there was that authoritative voice, I think, that you really injected into the character. Yeah, I think that it's there. I, I, you're referring to a, a documentary short called Character that was made about me by a woman named Vera Brunner Sung. I think that people can, I'm going to plug it right now, that people can access on the New Yorker YouTube film movie channel. Anyway, a good, a nice little movie. But yes, it, I think that character was actually a bit of a break from the typecasting that I'd been experiencing. The character in uh, Where the Buffalo Roam, the character in a movie called, a small movie called Mr. North, the character uh, in One Crazy Summer all stem from the character and, and the Twisted Sister videos all stem from the character Niedermeyer in Animal House. That was the first thing that people sort of saw me and notified. But my voice is low and authoritative and, and the maestro does have that, especially when he's, when he's crushed and he takes himself <laughs> very seriously. 
as most of my characters seem to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there is, there is a correlation, but I really, I feel like, and one, I got a good, a nice, um, what do you call it? A compliment from an a old friend of mine, Griffin Dunn. When he saw it, he said, it's so nice to see you doing something different. And Griffin's re really very good at, uh, at giving compliments that make you sort of think, was that a compliment? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but he, but he, he noticed it. It is a, it, it's, it's a different character. It's in a different vein. And I don't believe that I was there. I know that they really liked Animal House and they liked the character and they really appreciated my sense of comedy and my sense of irony. And uh, because that's infused all through everything that they do. So, yeah. Yeah, and and not and even more so, I think in the doll, your second episode. So we would lo love to hear, how, you know, the bringing you back with two different. I mean, Larry David writes the the maestro, obviously for you. It's called the maestro, right? You're the right. main the main through line, and then they bring you back for the doll. And I think you're even more that that kind of ironic uh, thing you're talking about there in, in the doll, where you you know you're you're so enthralled in 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 the you know when, when Elaine brings you the picture and just with right. with uh, you know Jerry Stiller and Kramer, but but first of all though, how how did that come about? I mean, obviously we're guessing you didn't know you were going to do two episodes when you first got the role, so no. they just kind of gave you the call back and said, listen, we wrote we wrote another you know wrote yeah, you back in. I mean, that, that that's exactly what they did. I I don't know if they had planned it. Or if it was they liked the character, liked what I brought to it, and they said, let's do something else with this guy. And they wrote it. Um, I don't know. I at one point suggested to Larry, Larry and I had a long conversation at the rap party. They do a big rap party at the end of every season. At the end of that season, 97, I think we shot it. Um, we were in a long conversation with Larry, and I suggested that uh, he do a spinoff called The Maestro that there was enough, <laughs> but uh, he thought he'd do a spinoff about himself instead, I guess. So. Right. We were actually talking about that before you came on that uh, we could see the maestro in, in a, in a curb episode. It, it seemed like almost a curb storyline kind of way, yeah. you know, it just seemed like that kind of character where, you know, Larry has a, you know, uh, an orchestra come to his house for some benefit and there's the maestro. Like it just seemed like a Larry David esque thing, you know, send Larry a letter or call him <laughs> or, or next time you see him. Sure. Well, what's yeah. funny, Mark, is we spoke with uh, Phil Morris, who was Jackie Childs, obviously. Oh, he played, oh yeah. He, yeah, he played a part in uh, your episode as well. Yeah. And he actually did try to make a spin off of him. Like, I, if, so, if somehow we can combine those forces and have a, a Jackie Childs maestro spin off, I think we got something <laughs> at NBC. But I guess, yeah, what, maybe, maybe Jackie Childs and the maestro could go on the Worldwide Wrestling uh, uh, Tour. And wrestle each other or something. <laughs> yeah, I'd pay to see it. So yeah, what? Tell us a little bit about kind of that experience. I know you had like Phil Morris on that original episode. All right. Uh, that first episode was great. I mean, obviously the security guard. You had, you had George with Susan. I mean, there was so much going on. Yeah. And yet, yet it was called the Maestro. It was called the Maestro because it was yeah that you know, that's sort of the way all of their episodes are built. It seems like there are several different stories all coming along that seem to have nothing to do with, with each other. But I think thematically there is something and they all end up sort of bumping into each other at the end. And the doll, of course, uh, she brings me the poster. I'm playing pool and everybody's everybody's wearing their boxer shorts uh, <laughs> because they don't want to get their pants wrinkled. And she brings me the poster and I spill, what do I, do I spill wine on it? I can't remember. She does. But, yeah. Late, Julie does. Yeah, does spill, yeah. That's right. She spills wine. And spill, oh yeah. As we, oh, and that's an, an yeah. Um, anyway, what was the question? I forgot. The, the You just touched on it. Actually, I was just going to go with that, that oh. kind of Jerry Stiller, maybe that, that scene with, with, you know, Michael Richards, the first episode you seem to spend much of your screen time with Julia. Right. The second episode, the doll, you're, 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 a, you're Michael Richards a lot. And well, Jerry Michael Stiller Richards and matter. Jerry mostly in the yeah, basement. That's, yeah. That's that had to be a lot of screen fun. time. Yeah. Yeah. That had that's to be a it. lot of fun shooting that those pool scenes there with Jerry Stiller and Michael Richards, all the, all the physicalness and everything like that. Yeah, the physical comedy is great and the working in that tight space and it's real, some real vaudeville stuff. An interesting moment for, of clarity for me about what it's like to do a uh, half-hour sitcom 
with guys who are really established is that I was working on a bit with my pool cue and a picture on the wall behind me in that tight space as we were just sort of getting used to the space and trying stuff. I was working a bit and Michael came over and said, you can't do that bit. I'm doing that bit. Uh. (laughs) And he's the star of the show. So he gets the bit and I didn't get the bit. I just had to play with my pants off and flirt with Mrs. Uh, Costanza, which was fun. <laughs> she was yeah. in that scene, too. Yeah, she brought yeah. those Budweiser's. Did you guys crack those open? I, I was. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think so. We were very professional. No, we didn't drink at all. <laughs> We've heard the rap party you mentioned. Those are a lot of fun. We heard some good stories yeah. about those rap parties. Yeah, they they go all out. The, the one for that season was at the... Uh, there's a big museum, an air, air, air and space museum or something at the Santa Monica Airport. Just a really big building with a lot of planes in it. And we did it there. It was really good. It's a hit show. When the stars are making, I think that season they were making 600 grand as every four days, which we shoot the show in four days. Um, it's uh, They can spend money on, on little right. hot dogs wrapped in, uh, in bacon. And that was that was Larry's last season, essentially. I yeah, wonder, it was part of part of the conversation that I had with Larry was he was telling me that he was tired of, in his words, and and I don't and I, he didn't mean it in a derogatory way at all, but he was tired of sort of standing in Jerry's shadow because he's a thinks of himself, thought of himself as a performer, and he is quite, quite a good performer in his in his own right. And he sort of was tired of doing that and getting tired of it. He found himself in a rut and he wanted to do something else and wanted to sort of explore himself in front of the camera. It took him a while, a couple of years, but he finally ended up with Curb. And now he's everywhere. I mean, you watch, uh, what do you want? I don't know what, I don't try not to watch anything that has commercials in it, but you watch television and he's there uh, inventing the light bulb or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, he's, very funny guy. He's he's doing okay. So yeah, he, yeah. He, he's doing okay. So did you kind of did you feel that kind of vibe on the set? I know you talked about the post party, but during those two episodes, did you kind of know like this might be his last kind of run at I, it? Or you know, I didn't have didn't have any idea. I didn't feel it until until we had that conversation during the rap party. I didn't. I wouldn't have guessed it again as an actor in the in the part in the play in the whatever it's called, teleplay. Uh, I'm not paying attention to too much of that stuff. I'm not necessarily, I, I'm not into sort of gossip, not to demean it or anything like that. But I, So I'm not really paying attention to that. I'm really paying more attention to my character and the relationships that I have with other characters and, and, the, and the, the structure of the scene, trying to find it and elucidate it, if so- I can use a big word. That's a that's an SAT word. So speaking of yeah. speaking of your character, the maestro. I mean, how did you uh, did you talk to anyone? Like, how did you? Whenever I think of a maestro now, I think of you. You know, I don't know. Like that's that's my well, reference. But thank you. When you watch Lenny Bernstein, you think <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's like so. How did you? How did you get ingrained like in becoming an actual kind of conductor and maestro? What kind of well, I listened. I didn't have much time because, as I said, we went to work on Monday. That's right. I listened. I listened to a lot of classical music anyway, and no classical music. I, as I often say, uh, I stopped listening to popular music when Beethoven died. But so I listened to a lot of that, and they brought a, a conductor in to sort of teach me how, without the baton, uh, a conductor might conduct something. So in that car scene, I can conduct. The way he might with the hands, uh. with the hands at the end, and so he, and I worked with him for an hour, a couple of hours, and mostly with that kind of stuff, and that kind of by that kind of stuff, I mean that genre, that kind of play, that kind of theater, because it's all theater in one way. It's it's about knowing, as John Gilgood, Sir, Sir John Gilgood said, style is knowing what kind of play you're in. Well, I knew I didn't know Seinfeld that well, but I could read the script and I watched it enough that I knew pretty much how they made it. So I spent most of my time trying to find the rhythm of that universe because it's every one is a complete universe into itself. And so 
Yeah. yeah. I didn't um, have time to do a lot of research. But no, but it sounds like, I mean, you, you had it down for sure. And especially that final scene. I love the final scene where they show the crowd, you know, the big maestro. He's in front of the, the you know, the right, queen. And the, bent, and the bent baton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with the bent baton. I mean, it's like such a, such, speaking of that irony thing, you take yourself so seriously that you're in front of this crowd of, uh, you know, elderly yeah. people and queens just doing I'm, the, you know. <laughs> I'm sure you've had Larry Thomas on probably. Uh, no, we have not actually. Super the Nazi. Super Nazi. Oh, no, 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 no. no. He, oh, you should. He liked No, we did have on, which reminds me of your character a lot, actually. And I'm not sure. I think you mentioned you did watch Seinfeld. I don't know how much of a fan of the show you had been prior to season seven. But um, Anthony Stark, who played Jimmy, um, I feel like there's a little a little correlation. Jimmy, the guy who sells the shoes, the strength footwear shoes. And he also had this like little bit of like anger behind the character. That's just a little, like could snap almost kind of how you would be. If someone said Bob Cobb, you're just Ugh, right. like, there's a little edge, which, right. which Seinfeld had a lot of uh, more than most sitcoms where the, the yeah. characters would have a bit of an edge and, you know, yeah. the humor uh, sometimes w- w- was, was kind of in that almost, almost darkness in a way. I mean, it wasn't a black comedy, like a dark comedy, but it was, it did for that time, especially, you know, when sitcoms were around there, mostly family and just kind of lighthearted. And, but, uh, you know, Cobb had this where you never know. He could just, you know, he just got a little bit anger there right behind, right behind there. You could tell, you know. Yeah. No, that's that's I think the brilliance of the writing and it's, it's inherent. You can see it in Curb. You can see it in everything Jerry does, that there is that recognition of the of the light and the dark, the good and the bad. And that characters do have and each of them certainly has. And Edge, I mean, the last episode, the hour long episode is basically about what horrible people they've been for <laughs> nine seasons and they get and they get punished for it at the end. So they uh, they, uh, they they send themselves to jail at the end. Yeah. And you, you like we mentioned, you had scenes with, you know, a variety of characters in the show. You were kind of the ne- the nemesis to Jerry. Right. You're friends with Kramer, obviously a love interest with Elaine. Right. Well, kind of, I guess, kind of speak to kind of the relationship you kind of had with each of those characters and kind of the, the chemistry, because you, you need chemistry when you're kind of the villain as well. Even with Jerry. I mean, right. I, I, yeah, I love that stuff. And obviously the friendship with Kramer, just, of course, I love how he's friends with everybody, you know? Yeah, he, no, he is. He's friends with everybody and he's easy to be friends with. And in order to sort of, cement that part of my knocking on the door, as you mo- notion, as you mentioned before, besides it being musical, some of that is to echo the kind of entrances that, that Kramer always does. Mm, yeah. So that if, if, I mean, if you can uh, bear with me getting a little anthropological, I, I wanted the maestro to be part of the same tribe that Kramer's part of, in a way. Um, so, so there's, and that, and he was, even though he stole my bit with the picture, he's a, he's a wonderful physical comedian, obviously, and great to yeah. work with. And all you have to do is, is not get in his way. So you don't get it knocked down. And, uh, and he's, he plays right into the moment. And I had known, or George said that he had known me in New York before. And I think I had known of him. I don't believe that I actually knew him. Uh, but he knew of me in New York when we were small stage actors. And, uh, and he's a wonderful actor, a good actor, a very inclusive actor. I mean, a lot of actors and some movie stars tend to be, tend to do the work all by themselves. They don't work with the other person, but stage actors have to work with the other person because you're on stage with them. And Jerry has such a great appreciation for good actors and talent. And, and I mean, you can tell that by what he's done with his life since, besides going on road, going back to stand up, but the, the thing he did with uh, Ricky Gervais and uh, CK Dexter Haven, not CK Dexter Haven. What's his name? Yeah. Louis CK. Louis CK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know who CK Dexter Haven is? I don't know. You should watch, watch a movie called, um, uh, Oh, gosh, now I can't remember it. I'm blanking on the name. Philadelphia Story. The Philadelphia Story with Hepburn and Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart. Cary Grant plays a character huh? called Seagate Dexter Haven. Brilliant movie. Brilliant, brilliant movie. Anyway, Jerry has such a great appreciation for performers, and you can tell that from that 
that documentary or that sort of live, that conversation he had with Ricky Gervais about comedy, the way he talks about comedy and breaks it down. So he's great to play with because he just is so happy to be there with you. If you know right. what you're doing and you're doing it honestly. And I mean, you could see if you watch that show regularly and I don't, I don't, I, like, I don't know all the characters the way you guys do, but you, you can see him cracking up sometimes. Yeah, because for sure. He's having such a good time just yeah. watching. And Elaine, we've talked about Elaine. Elaine's a brilliant comedian, brilliant actress. And, uh, and it, anytime you're working with people like that, it's like playing tennis. They always say play tennis with somebody who's better than you are because your game will get better. And the same is true of acting. The same is probably true of anything. Don't unless you just want to keep patting yourself on, on the back and feel really good about yourself. Don't play with people that are not as good as you are. Play with people that are at least as good or better because it makes you come up. It makes you rise. And that working on that with those people with that that kind of writing makes you rise. You you rise or you get terrified and you sink. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's well said. And, you know, sp and speaking of that, I mean, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask about, I mean, Douglas Kenny, uh, speaking of, you know, kind of a, a yeah. genius, you know, comedy, you know, icon in, in this world. And you 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 were in Animal House and then you were also in uh, A Stupid and Futile Gesture, which I thought was kind of nice that you kind of were in the movie that was about Douglas Kenny and, and uh, you know, and yeah. also the movie that he wrote, right? And I, I wish that story. movie had been better. I thought the book was pretty good, so I said I'd do it. And I wish the movie had been better. Because I, I have almost the same feeling as I do about a Buffalo Roam with that with that movie is that I think it could I feel like it could have been better too. It was it was well done I thought because I I didn't know a lot of the story I didn't read the book yet I need to read the book but yeah. uh, um I just it's just great you know I just wondered if you if you had any any stories there about you know working with him or even just working on Animal House with 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 the, you know that those kind of iconic uh, yeah working with and, working with Doug was it was great uh, I did, we didn't have any any screen time with him. But I spent quite a bit of time while we were making it with him, primarily because he told me early on that Niedermeyer was based in part on his older brother, who, mm. if I remember correctly, died when Doug was fairly young and was also kind of the golden child, the chosen one, the one that was going to do everything right. And they need and I can't remember how he died. I can't remember. I apologize. But uh but so I talked to him because I wanted to honor that in the way I played the character without without taking it too serious, uh, seriously. But uh, just the fact that it there was a gravitas to the way Doug talked about that character uh, that that is what makes it work, I think, and makes the character work. And it's what makes the whole story work. And so many of the imitations and spin-offs not work is the fact that there is a real gravitas, a, 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 a dark and serious center to everything. Yeah. That that's that's where the comedy, the comedy, comedy works better if it's not trying to be funny. Right. Exactly. There has to be that, like you said, that dark. Yeah. That's where Douglas Kenny had, yeah, had, I think. Um, are you, um, are you still in Missoula? Did you, I know you, we, we read that you live in Missoula. Is that still where you're at I now? Don't. Or? I, I, unfortunately okay. I had to, I moved from there. Uh, I had to move. I was chased out of town. <laughs> no, I did. I lived there. I'm going back there in about three weeks I, yeah. to go play. I, I lived there for a little bit too. Um, oh yeah. I actually worked and lived at Glacier National Park. And, oh, what and a great in place between, to live. Yeah, exactly. So I lived at Glacier Park for a summer, right. and and then I moved to Missoula for like the winter, spring. Went back to Glacier Park for another summer. Right. And then I said, either I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, or I got to like get back to reality. And I came back to New York and stuff. But I was this close to doing it again because it's amazing. But I know that you had lived in Missoula, just you know, top hat and uh, and yeah. Just, oh, you, know, you were there during the top hat years. So oh you yeah. There when I was there, yeah. I saw Bernie Morel at the top hat. I don't know if you know Bernie. Oh, yeah. I saw Bernie Morel at the top hat. There was like. You know, not even 100 people in the place probably is incredible. But, um, yeah. you know, there are a lot of people in Missoula who, who would say that moving back to New York City was not moving back to reality. <laughs> Very bad. That's the right way to say it. Yeah, you're right about that. Well, it's not there anymore. The top hat. Are you telling me? Is that is that true? It's not there anymore or is it still there? No, the top hat. The top hat's still there. That guy, oh. uh, Nick, okay. uh, has gone uh He's all entrepreneurial. He bought the Wilma around the corner. Oh, he owns the Wilma, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah, the top up, hat. Uh, an open air venue out at the uh, big sky. Uh, 
uh, the no, not, uh, not Big Sky. Out, out where the Blackfoot uh, runs. Oh, into that's the by Clark Glacier. Fork called Kettle, uh, Kettle House. Kettle House Brewery, and he owns it. I think he he put it together for oh, Kettle House Brewery. Cool. Put that up a lot of money. Yeah, it. yeah. That's a fun. That's a funny line, though. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't reality, but I, I just, I, yeah, I, I so you get caught up in that, that, that. Yeah. Glacier Park World and the black and the that whole that whole area. Oh, yeah. but, uh, and 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 there's a uh, there's not a lot of there's a low ceiling there. You I mean you re- you reach the top of the food chain pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean true. intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, pretty quickly. So you go back to New York, you get challenged a little bit more, and you find out more about yourself. I'd move back to New York in a minute if I could afford it. So you did live you you did live in New York, huh? Oh, I lived in New York from 1971 till 1993, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I lived down the Lower East Side. Oh, wow. All right. And where did you, 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 you grew up in Ohio? Oh, I was born in Ohio, spent summers in Ohio, g- grew up until I was 14 in uh, Missouri, a little suburb of St. Louis called Webster Groves, and then moved to New Jersey. Went to high school in New Jersey, went back to the Midwest, to Michigan, to college, and then went on the road because it was the Vietnam War and I didn't want to fight. So I went underground uh, out west for a couple of years, year and a half about, until I got back. And then I, uh, what happened then? Oh, and then I started doing professional acting. and Did a season in Milwaukee, and then I moved to New York after a season in Milwaukee, at Milwaukee Rep. I moved back to New York because that's where the theater is. Wow. So wait, where in Jersey did you, was that stop? Westfield. Westfield Colonial, okay. West, Colonial Westfield. Do you know Jersey? Yeah, yeah. I'm in Westwood right now. It was oh, okay. Bergen. But yeah, Westfield is, you know, on the way a little south. Yeah, we're just, uh, just off of Route 22 near Mountainside, near Cranford. Scotch, Scotch Plains, Plains all that crap. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, Scotch Plains. And then, uh, and then, so you're a Wolverine when you say Michigan? Yeah, I was a Wolverine. Oh wow! All right. I played. Uh, I played on the freshman basketball team the year after. I think Cassie Russell was a senior. I think they'd won the NCAA championship the year before. I was. I was a walk on. I didn't. I didn't. Nobody recruited me. I was a walk on. Made the freshman team, and then we scrimmaged against the varsity. And I was a guard. Cassie was a bar- guy. I don't know if you remember Cassie Russell. Yeah. He played for the Knicks later. Uh, he was a guard, so I guarded Cassie Russell. Uh, I went home, called the coach, and quit. <laughs> it was a very different game, the way they played street ball in Detroit to the way, you know, the skinny white kid. Who I, I thought it was a combination of ballet and jazz, but it's not. It's a wow, and that's sport. And that's back in the day when they had freshman teams. And yeah. I, I, re- I remember, I recall, Lou, Lou Alcindor, his freshman team beat the varsity team, UCLA, back oh. in the day. Oh, it did. I didn't know that. It's, that, was, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That was a telltale sign. Um, so that's that's kind of a great a great path, obviously. And obviously, New York theater is is just yeah. what's more iconic than that. Yeah. Um, and we talked about all these beer spots, but the maestro was a wine guy, right? On set, really? he was drinking the red wine. Yeah. Uh, Tuscany. What do you like? What do you remember when you first kind of got that script and you're reading it? You're like who is this guy? Like, how do I, he talks about Tuscany, he's drinking wine, he's flirtatious yet demanding. I mean, that's kind of what you were thinking when you first laid your out, laid your eyes on that script. He's he's a, he's a bit of a narcissist. Like, uh, like a lot of good characters are Uh, egocentric, uh, slightly pretentious, but takes him and takes himself very seriously. I could tell that right away. Uh, I let the notion of being, of living your life in classical music uh, imbue me with, with uh, I, I let classical music sort of imbue me with that kind of com- com- the complexity that classical music has, the depth and the layering and stuff like, not that I layered the character that much, but I certainly let that sensibility move through me as much as I could. Um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I got it and I thought, I want to just jump back to and I got when I got the script of Animal House, I was told I was auditioning for the part of Otter. Uh, the Tim Matheson part of Gets All the Girls. Mm-hmm. But Landis said to me as soon as I walked in the door, do you know how to ride? And I knew right away what he was talking about, because as Bruce McGill said later, and we agreed, Niedermeyer is the best acting part in that movie. 
for an actor. He maybe won't get the most attention, but it's the best part because he so takes himself so seriously. He's just there's and there and you can add all kinds of depth to him, all the depth you want, and he's still going to be funny. He's a buffoon, and you don't have to try to make him a buffoon. I mean, he's a fool. He's like one of Shakespeare's fools. The more serious he is, the more committed and co and connected to the, his vision of the world he is, the funnier he'll be. And the same is true, I could see, for the maestro, because yeah. he has that kind of yeah. sense of self-involvement, that sense of narcissism. Not, not narcissism the way we've learned to understand the word uh, after four years of Donald Trump. Oh, now it's an evil, evil thing. And it's not a healthy thing. I don't mean that. But there's a sense of just everything you look at in the world is telling you about yourself. And the, the maestro is that kind of character. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the word foolishness. Like, yeah, police, uh, police benevolent association conductor. But there was such a command, right? Like, Seinfeld's a show you relax, you watch, you're relaxing. But like when you spoke, like I, I kind of stand up and listen. Like the maestro had such a, uh, you know, a <laughs> command to him, even though it was like how he wanted to make out the lane. Or, swoop the lane uh, up real quick, like like Jerry said. <laughs> yeah. You really worked the. Uh, I mean, that's one of the best uh, <laughs> best pickups in the whole show. Better than Lloyd Braun, even probably. It was uh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see, we got rough right away. Right, we, we 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 say the same thing at the same time, and do we do. Uh, uh, Golden Earth Hope kind of thing, or is that yeah, um, yeah. Well, I I mean I think that kind of comes with my. It's hard for me not to do that. I can't play uh, Hugh Grant kind of stuff. Uh, J Jimmy Kahn used to call Hugh Grant Skippy because he was like a little dog named Skippy because he's all over the place and fun, funny and charming and does his own stuff. But I, uh, yeah, because of my voice, because of my brain, probably, um, I have uh, and a kind of authority where if I speak, you sit up. I'm glad you sit up straight when I speak. That's good. I'm not going to punish you. It's all right. <laughs> you get an A for this class. Well, well yeah, luckily I'm standing tonight. But um, <laughs> like I said, Mark, this, this has been a treat. You, well, you know, your, your, your presence your command, your your whole career has just been really special. And, you know, especially on Seinfeld, which we focus, of course. Right. Um, it, it, just such a treat. And I uh, can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Yeah, that's all right. You guys will be in business for a long time because I think that that show will keep playing and playing and playing and playing and playing for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like it, the whole show is iconic. It's it taught. The television hasn't come up with anything as sort of that changed it as much as Seinfeld has. Uh, they haven't come up with anything yet, I don't think, except maybe Reservation Dogs, which I think probably uh, owes friend uh, Kimberly Guerrero. Dog. We spoke with uh, we uh, spoke with Kimberly. We spoke with Kimberly Guerrero from Reservation Dogs. She played Renona in in Seinfeld. Oh, yeah, yeah. Scars through Indian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Groundbreaking. Yeah. That's what we said about you know that show and, and also Seinfeld. Like you said, it's groundbreaking. Yeah. And I think I think even Reservation Dogs owes something to Seinfeld. The four four characters. I mean, I, I just read something that said it 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 came off of Friends, but Friends is so directly related to Seinfeld without the without the right. edge. Right. And right. Reservation Dogs has the edge, so I think it's much more. Uh, it, it it probably wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for Seinfeld. So yeah. And listen, name name a show of Friends that you remember, like. We, we, the maestro, we all remember it, right? At the end of the day, yeah, uh, that's the impact it had, and the, the guest stars shine. So, yeah. Mark, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you I appreciate it. Great. Thank you guys. You're doing a good Thank job, you. and it was fun talking to you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Yeah, bye.